everyone, and happy Standards Day. So if you didn't know it was Standards Day, it's not that big of a celebration, but standards make everything in our lives a little bit easier. We don't realize all of the things that we have today that rely on standards. YouTube does, your video does, your phone does, everything runs off of standards. And one type of standard is schema. So even though we've talked about schema a little bit on this channel before, I am primarily going to be focusing on two different types of schema in this video, and that is an upper ontology and a lightweight ontology. One is more schema-like than the other. So why would you need to know the difference between these two? My goal in this video is to make sure that while you are out there in the wild, if you do find something called an ontology, you can identify is it an upper ontology that can mix and match and be used for interoperability and tying a lot of different schema together. By the way, that is why you'd want an upper ontology. Or is it a lightweight ontology, something that is not as interoperable as an upper ontology, but it is very uh, domain specific, very specific to maybe even one use case. And maybe that's all you really need for your use case. So I hope you get that out of this video. And with that, let's go check it out. Okay, so for today's video, I am mostly going to be bumping around in BioPortal. BioPortal is something I've mentioned numerous times on this channel. I am a big fan. BioPortal is a great place to go and learn about ontologies in general. But the focus of this video is you might not realize what you're looking at when you are in BioPortal. So let's start with schema.org. So I like to use this one because a lot of us interact with a lot of different data on the web. Schema.org is basically the schema for the web. Not all websites have to use it, but it is called a micro language. Basically, it's underneath all of the pages to help Google understand how to index what is on your web page. So here you can see that schema.org has classes like data type, this is going to tell you how to use data type in schema.org schemas. It's hard to say that by the way, schema.org schema. I wish they had come up with a better name. So for this, I'm going to jump down into the thing category. So normally an ontology starts with thing. So these are the main components, the main uh, assets that you can find within schema.org. There's different actions. Let's look at the consume actions. So you can drink, you can eat, you can install, you can listen. All of these things would be on the back of your website saying, oh, here you can eat something. Here you can drink something. Here you can watch something. Those are actions. If somebody is looking to do something, you know, when you go into Google and it tells you, you know, here are all the bars and all the restaurants, these are some of the tags that they're looking at to do that indexing. You can see why that's general though. This is just talking about drinking in a general sense. So that would mean coffee drinking and alcohol drinking. When you get into the specifics, that's more of a lightweight ontology, a taxonomy, or maybe even an instance level of a knowledge graph. So let's collapse action and go into creative work. So creative work is you know, articles, books, it also includes other creative works that would be like drawing and images and code, which is kind of a little bit of both in my opinion. Uh, it includes videos just like this. So if you go into Google and you look at the tabs at the top and you select a video, it knows this is a video because YouTube has tagged everything as a video. So the thing you're looking at now probably has schema.org tags on it somewhere in the background. So. Thank you, YouTube, for doing that for me. Let's go and look at social media posting. Let's open up blog posting and then live blog posting. Not sure what the difference between live and not. So if it's a good schema, it's going to have descriptions. So it has live blog posting. And the definition, a blog post intended to provide a rolling textual coverage at an ongoing event. So almost like a news sort of thing. That was very helpful. Now I understand a little bit more about the schema. Good schema are always going to have definitions on how to use them. So when we're talking about an upper ontology, it's really helping you dictate how to structure your individual data. So when we were talking about ontologies and how, you know, you can use those to add 
the rules and the validation to your data, this is how you would do it. So this is really talking about getting at that higher level abstraction of your asset. When you get into the more specifics, that's where you would use more common schema, right? So that's how you interoperate, right? If you have a system that knows what Dublin Core is or already knows what schema.org is, you point it to this URL, to the schema.org URL or IRI is what that is called. And what that does is it allows your system to know what the rules of engagement are. It knows what a social media posting is because it's being pointed to these sites, these websites, and it will be able to read this. So your systems know what it's about. Okay, so this ontology schema is a little different than your typical schema that you would use for a database because your database schema is really just describing what assets you have and no relations between them. Now you can make different tables to express the, the, the relationships between them, but really the schema itself is not making those relationships. The schema itself is saying, this is a name, this is a birth date. Once you start to connect those things together, that's really where you get into the ontology part of the upper ontology area because it's still a schema. It's still telling you that this is a title and this is a contributor, but what it does, it also defines the relationships between them. And when you're looking at those relationships between the two classes, that is a book always has an author. It's those rules that make an ontology different than a regular schema. And these are upper ontologies. Now let's go look at a lightweight ontology. It is a little different. So you will not see any of these say upper ontology, lightweight ontology. You won't see that as a classification on any of these. And that's why I'm doing this video because it is a little difficult if you, especially if you're starting out or maybe you've not dealt with ontology a whole lot. Maybe you've only worked with one ontology in your whole career. There's nothing wrong with that, but knowing the difference is going to help you as you continue your learning. So here we're in the human disease ontology. Okay, so right off the bat, you can see that this is a little different. So the topmost class is not thing, it is disease. Well, that makes sense. This is a human disease ontology. But if you actually look at the different classes, you can see these really are very specific. It's not a generalized statement as we were seeing in the upper ontology schema.org. This is really looking at very specific things. You can see that the metadata is quite extensive for these. You can also see that there's a tree view. Hmm, This is looking a little bit like a taxonomy, isn't it? So it is. When we talk about the evolution between a taxonomy into an ontology. Usually people are talking about that taxonomy into an upper ontology as an instance. So it's looking at it as an instance level. But what you can also do is with a taxonomy, you can merge it into an ontological structure without having to have that upper ontology. Now you might ask yourself, well, you still need a schema. Yes, of course. You can use SCOS that's very common with these kind of uh, lightweight ontologies. So normally lightweight ontologies are focused on specific things. So these are still like the universals. That's why it is still a class, but it's talking about these as if they are instances. And you can actually put these in as instances if you like. That's the interesting thing about lightweight ontologies. You can put the specifics into the instance level you can also leave them at the class level. Now, why would you want a lightweight ontology? Lightweight ontologies, they do still support interoperability between individual vocabularies, but they don't necessarily support the interoperability between different systems. You're not necessarily mapping different schema together. You're mapping the values within those schema. So here you're looking at a specific type of, of disease, a physical disorder. If you needed to find what other vocabularies use this 
this term specifically or a, a synonym of this to map all of that context, all of those semantics together, and we're going to see that here, you can see that this word in this ontology is being mapped to all these other, so SNOMED is a very popular one in medical, all of these are being mapped because all of these also have either this exact concept or class or they have something very similar. So why would you want to do this? Well, semantic search for one, if somebody is typing in this word, but maybe they're, they're used to using a different uh, schema somewhere else, you want to make sure that whatever word they're putting into the search engine will give them a good result. Other reasons you might want to do this, machine learning contexts, right? Machines are great at picking up on patterns. They're not so good at picking up on context. Now we have made so many, so many big things in machine learning news nowadays that, you know, that claim is not as strong as it used to be. Uh, machines understand context a whole lot better than they used to, but adding these semantic synonyms and um, the, the depth and the commonality of certain synonyms and other types of contextual pieces of information, that's really where you get a lightweight ontology. A lightweight ontology is also really useful for just an internal vocabulary. If you have to load it into uh, any of your SharePoint sites, or maybe you have a few different vocabularies that different departments are using, or maybe they're using different standards, and I'm not talking schema standards here. Maybe you work in engineering, and maybe you have a few different R&D projects. If they all are using different documents to build their helicopter propellers, you might have some problems being able to link all of those things together so they all are aware of what everyone else is doing is also a great reason to have a lightweight ontology. Okay, so both of these are quite common. You do find more open source, easily accessible upper ontologies because they're upper ontologies. A lot of people are using them so they can be interoperable and they can do more machine inferencing. That's another reason that they're very popular. Now, if you have very uh, specific internal systems and you don't necessarily need to be interoperable with anything else, maybe you're just trying to connect a lot of things together, or maybe you're trying to eliminate those hops when you're trying to do a query, maybe your lightweight ontology is there to answer certain questions, which it always should be answering certain questions, not just connecting things together. Maybe you really needed to find out all of the protagonists that are in James Cameron movies that fall in love. Maybe that's, by the way, I'm working on something for that. Maybe that's something that you need to be able to query quickly. Um, these are just some examples. Uh, you can add in a lot of predictive analytics in lightweight ontologies. You might even combine the upper ontologies to get the data in if you're doing an ETL, which is extract, transform, and load. Maybe you use that upper ontology to bring everything in so you can easily query all of it together. Or maybe you just bring it all in and dump it in and see what happens, which is called an ELT, extract, load, and transform. You transform at the analytics piece. We're going to go over that actually in our next video. So I hope you've enjoyed that. Please, if I went over something too quickly or I didn't explain something thoroughly enough, please leave it in the comments below. And if there's anything I'm missing that you would love to see a video on, please go ahead and suggest it. So with that, Thank you very much, and I'll catch you next time.